Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this redgamingtech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I apologise for not being on camera today, but it has been rather chaotic, uh, including the, let's just say, not too healthy nature of my phone, which prompted me to do a last minute switcheroo with it and also um, I'm finishing off an analysis and a couple of reviews so today I just don't really have the time to reset everything back up uh, to film a news video so I apologize for audio only but it'll be back to normal uh, tomorrow but anyway we're going to start things out with a uh, with the Nintendo Switch Pro because Nintendo have officially stated that we will not see this console launch this year and this is according to Nintendo of America's chief Mr. Bowser. I, I, I'm sorry but can we just spend a moment to appreciate how brilliant it is that his name is uh, Bowser. I mean that's just one of those things where if you were writing this as a fictional novel no one would believe it. It's just the best thing ever. It, it's just amazing. Anyway, um, so according to Bowser, he said, and I quote, Nintendo Switch Lite will be the only new Nintendo Switch hardware this holiday. And that the standard Switch will not be receiving an upgrade. Uh, this is actually in a press briefing and it is covered by CNET. So there are some components within the existing as existing, excuse me, standard Switch model that will be changing and we've actually seen various filings on the FCC, uh, which obviously means that if there's a part that needs to be changed over uh, or the underlying technology is tweaked, then it does need to uh, go back in for reapproval. So what we can probably gather here is that the original Switch model will also be seeing tweaks to the processor as well as the flash storage. So basically there's not going to be a radically different version of the SOC that's found inside the light and standard model. They are going to basically be identical, uh, but it's not going to be what you consider an upgrade. So we're not going to see, for the sake of argument, a drastic increase in the number of CUDA cores because remember this is actually created by AMD, sorry by Nvidia, the uh, the the sock inside the system or something like that. It's going to be uh, slight changes, possibly a shrink. Although exactly what's going on, we're not certain yet. Nintendo are quite cagey when it comes to the actual innards of the console, so we may have to wait for a teardown for official confirmation to know what's really going on. And now we're going to move over to Intel. And this one's a bit of a saga, although we'll also be talking about uh, some really cool new technology from Intel towards the end. But this one's a bit of a saga, and it details Comet Link. So a couple of days ago, I basically uh, covered a fake leak, and I emphasized the fact that there is pretty much no chance that that leak is genuine. But since then, several other websites have reported it. Unfortunately, uh, it's really... Very unlikely. I'll just say that, that it's legit. Uh, there are multiple reasons that I believe that the leak from a couple of days ago are, are suspect. Uh, one of them is the dollar sign being at the end of the pricing, which is uh, completely contrary to how Intel uh, provide roadmaps to members of the press or just in general SKU lists. Uh, we have the uh, clock, sorry, the, um, the TDP figures, which don't make sense. Uh, and also a whole bunch of other stuff. But there is actually a set of slides which have been leaked by the publication X Fastest. If memory serves, they're actually based in Hong Kong. They're a pretty cool website, and this information actually looks a lot more legitimate, uh, and it does detail uh, Intel's upcoming products, including Comet Lake. So, uh, the slide that I'm going to start things out is Intel Core Comet Lake S Platform Overview. As you can probably see from the uh, diagram, uh, it looks very similar to what we already have. So we have USB 3.1 support, PCI Express 3 is still there, SATA 3.0, integrated Wi-Fi, Thunderbolt, uh, USB 2 of course, so you've got some ports for that, along with other bits and bobs like you know HD audio and whatever else. Uh, it does look like they are testing uh, 2,933 megahertz memory support uh, per channel, but obviously this is official. So just like MSI or 
uh, Asus or whomever can officially support overclocking. Uh, it's not uh, with the 300 series, it's not going to be any different for this, but uh, so far it's still listing the two channel memory as 2660. 2666. Uh, so, under the key features, they've basically, assuming this slide's legitimate and person, I believe it most likely is, we'll get into why in just a moment. Uh, the 10 core processor and 20 threads is reconfirmed here. They have yet further enhancements to core and memory overclocking. There's the Intel Turbo Boost Technology 2.0. Uh, we also have a, a plethora of display technologies, including uh, HDR support, HVEC, 10-bit hardware, decode, encode, blah, 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 blah. Uh, integrated USB 3.1 and Gen 2. Uh, support for integrated Intel Wireless, Bluetooth 5. Uh, next generation Intel Optane memory support for Thunderbolt 3, support for Intel Smart uh, Smart Sound technology with quad core audio DSP. That was a bit of a mouthful, and also support for modern standby. For the platform details, and this is one of the reasons I'm very certain this is well not very certain, but more certain that this is legit legitimate. Uh, the LGA socket is listed with 1,200 pins. I've been told uh, by a couple of sources that this is the pin count for the new socket. For the power envelope for enthusiasts, it's 125 watts. Obviously, 125 watt TDP is not going to be for like a 4-core processor. That's going to be for the 10-core 20 thread unlocked part. But we all know uh, Intel and TD... Well, to be fair, any company in TDP is a bit of a... <laughs> a bit optimistic, but Intel, especially if you're using like an all-core all enhanced turbo, then certainly, uh, but that, to be honest, is more down to the motherboard manufacturers anyway. Anyways, um, the uh, Infuse-S part is listed at 125 watts. Platform I.O., uh, I'm not going to read out all of that because you're just able to see it on screen yourself. So, basically, the reason I'm pretty confident that this is legit is because I've heard several sources tell me that the uh, power, uh, sorry, the TDP is now 125 watts. I've also been told that LGA 1200 is going to be a thing. Basically, it's one of the reasons that we don't have uh, backwards compatibility, or sorry, back uh, forwards compatibility. There you go. Uh, one of the reasons we don't have forwards compatibility with the 300 series boards is because Intel had to up the pin count, and primarily that's to deliver more energies. In other words, it's to uh, provide more stable voltages to the CPU. And next up is the desktop platform consumer roadmap. And currently, we are on the 9900K. And uh, this is going to remain consistent until the first quarter of next year. I've actually heard mixed things. Someone, uh, a couple of people told me it may be this year we're going to see Comet Lake S. But um, I, I would probably lean towards the first quarter of next year. I don't think Intel will launch Comet Lake this year. Um, I think it will be next year. That's my personal um, that's my personal takeaway on that. And then under the desktop product roadmap, uh, we have a plethora of different uh, um, products. And currently, we are of course on the Coffee Lake Refresh, which is the 300 series, which is up to eight cores, 95 watts. And then uh, this is going to be uh, replaced next year in the first quarter with up to 10 cores, 125 watts, uh, with the case series SKU. And then we also have uh, other things for the corporate side of things as well. So um, from what I understand, this is going to be the roadmap. Uh, so we're going to have to wait for a little bit um, for that. And it's going to be interesting to see what Intel does. A couple of processors on Amazon are already receiving price cuts, including the KF part, uh, which obviously does not have the uh, iGPU active. It's a 9900K. Uh, I believe it was a $50 US price cut, which is not shabby, honestly. Um, although it's going to still mean that Intel doesn't really have anything to, to uh, counter AMD in the short term. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in terms of pricing. So the last thing we're going to be discussing is Intel, because they are creating a technology, or rather improving the technologies they already have, plus as well uh, creating a few new ones that essentially are very close to what we already have with AMD's chiplets, but they are implementing it rather differently. 
Uh, and it really emphasizes the interconnects, which are kind of the unsung heroes when it comes to the creation of processors. Uh, a couple of days ago, I actually did cover that uh, Jim Keller, who now, of course, works at uh, Intel, he's a legendary chip art architect, uh, he actually said that if you think that Moore's Law is dead, you're stupid. And I guess it depends on how you want to take Moore's Law. If you are someone who's a stickler and believes that Moore's Law is actually in reference purely to the reduction or rather the shrinking of transistors, that's the correct word, not reduction, the shrinking of transistors, then, yeah, Moore's Law is not as healthy as it was. Um, let's just be honest. But if you are instead the believer that uh, Moore's Law is instead the principle of actually increasing the performance of chips, then yes, Moore's Law is still alive because of things like chiplets and the actual new packaging technologies and so on and so on that uh, we are creating. And by we, obviously, we mean companies like AMD, Intel, NVIDIA, and so on. So the actual idea of creating a monolithic die has inherent weaknesses. If the larger the die that you're creating, the more complex, just obviously the more chance there is that something's going to go oopsie and not work anymore, which can somewhat be uh, circumvented by yields and binning, but it's not exactly the best way to produce chips, and there are much more efficient and elegant solutions. The reason that you can have more elegant solutions as well is that if you have a chiplet approach, you have a lot more flexibility by simply saying, hey, we can put this chip together with this chip together with this chip and create a more custom solution for a particular client or sector. So, for example, if you want to put a block of, I don't know, four CPU cores with a specific GPU and whatever else, then it's fairly easy to do that. And you can package that with different memory, uh, integrated memory uh, solutions, for example, high bandwidth memory or whatever you want to do. And it's just easier to be able to create that. It's much more easier uh, and it's quicker to time to market. So Intel are creating multiple new technologies to do this with the most influential of those being omnidirectional interconnect. We'll discuss that further in just a moment. Now, I will say that I will be doing a much deeper analysis of this in the not-too-distant future, uh, but so many people messaged and tweeted me, uh, several people emailed me about this and asked my opinion. I wanted to cover it kind of in brief in a news video, and then I'll do a deeper analysis uh, soon. But basically, you might recall we've already discussed EMIP before. Uh, so EMIP was the foundational technology used in KeyBlink G, uh, which was ironically, I suppose, a partnership with Intel, uh, sorry, Intel and AMD. Uh, we actually saw a KeyBlink CPU and AMD provided the Vega GPU and basically uh, Intel used EMIP to package them together into a shiny, happy chip. And Foveros, meanwhile, is a stacked die technology. Uh, Foveros is going to be used in the upcoming Lakefield processors and they actually will be using both Atom and Core chips for low power applications and uh, so Foveros is that. So now Intel are co combining those two technologies, so philosophies, into CoEMIB along with ODI, uh, once again uh, omnidirectional. So Intel believes that this will improve product level performance, power, and area while enabling, quote, a complete rethink of system architecture. So using ODI, once again, omnidirectional interconnect, uh, Intel are en enabling the uh, prospect of creating better communication between multi multiple stacked chiplets. So basically, they can create a single integrated circuit. So in theory, this means that they can assemble products quite quickly, and as I mentioned a moment ago, they can create uh, chips customized based upon whatever parts that a specific client wants you to create for them. And also, uh, in Intel's own blurb for ODI, the actual wires, I mean, you can see them on screen, the actual wires are thicker than what you would normally see through TSVs. 
So the benefit of that, at least in theory, obviously we've only got Intel's word for it so far, is that you have lower resistance. So in theory, anyway, you can have better power delivery uh, directly from the actual package substrate itself. So theoretically, we will see higher bandwidth, lower latency, and be better power delivery. And basically, the complexity of actually putting a die together, putting a chip together, should be reduced. So Intel's vision, I suppose, is a little bit like AMD's here. It's going to take a while, though, for this to start to trickle down to consumer products, for, for, for real-world products. Um, and you might recall that uh, there has been a lot of talk for uh, the new Intel XC uh, GPUs. I don't know if it's Generation 1 or Generation 2. I'm betting it's probably going to be Generation 2. Uh, that will actually really be leveraging this technology. So basically, from what I've heard and what the rumors are, uh, the, the GPUs themselves will be created in a multi-GPU fashion or multi-chiplet fashion, whatever you want to say. And essentially, they will be able to piece them together depending upon the scenario. For example, if they want to put a whole bunch of HBM2 memory on there, or they want to create a really, really powerful GPU for a data center, or if they want to create like a modest gaming GPU or what have you. So it should be really cool, at least in theory. Um, and yeah, AMD have certainly got them, uh, got ahead of them, uh, but which technology in the end proves to be more, well, just better, who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume, and I, I'm pretty sure most people would agree that in that, uh, Intel may be de developing this, but it's not like AMD are like, okay, guys, we're done. Uh, we never need to improve anything ever again. Obviously, for uh, for future processors, they are certainly going to be improving the uh, improving their package technology as well. Anyway, um, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff: like, share, comment, and subscribe because it helps us out an absolute ton. And I'll see you soon. Take care, yourselves. Bye for now.